Would you stand with me this morning? Are you blessed and highly favored of God this day? Amen. Amen. Father, we come into your presence this morning, and we've come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Have your way in this service as we give you praise. Amen. Turn on praise and Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is with whatever man we say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Thank you. 
know that we can stand in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah.
morning. Chapter 23. All right. I'm not going to read yet, but I want to tell you a little bit about something. Um, I've told you that Scripture is all about context. I told you there are three types of context. How many remember them? Immediate context. That's what it's saying right there. The verses above it and below it. Then there is I'll think of it in just a moment. One of the nice things about some of this medication is it doesn't let your memory work like it used to. Anyways. Uh, then there's I'm going to call it intermediate, okay? That is where it is. You look at the chapter before, the chapter after. And then there's canonical context. What does the entire Bible say about what you're talking about? You can't. If it doesn't agree in Genesis, what you're preaching about in Revelation, it's wrong. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Now I know we can get into the squabble. There's certain places that it disagrees. Uh, well, mo more than likely, it's not the Bible that's disagreeing. <laughs> it's you're looking for a flaw in it. And we don't believe there's any flaws in the Bible. Amen. But I only say that to tell you, I want to look at the chapter before chapter 23 and the chapter after for a moment. In these three Psalms, that's 22 through 24, there are actually precious pieces of Hebrew poetry. Um, in, in Psalms 22, we have a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Good Shepherd. That Psalm is clear, a clear prophecy about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're looking forward to the Old Testament, Psalms 22 is a crucifixion chapter. Uh, Psalms 24 is a picture of the chief shepherd. So you have the good shepherd, and then 24 is the chief shepherd. And that is, he, uh, he's pictured as a, a king coming in power and in glory. Now sandwiched between those two, we have Psalms 23. And that's one of the most well-known and beloved pieces of passages in the Bible. And here, Jesus is pictured as the great shepherd. In Psalms 22, pictures the death of Jesus for sinners. That is the event that made it possible for us to be saved. Thank God for that. Psalms 24 pictures the end of the age when the king himself in perfect righteousness on that day, those who have been washed in his blood and saved by his grace will reign with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17 tells us that we're going to uh, not sleep. We're going to be raised in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, so Psalms uh, 24 again, picture of the end of the age. Uh, but between the time we get saved and the time we go home to heaven, we have a life to live. And that's where Psalms 23 comes into play. And I want to share that with you. Now, we told you the chief meaning of Jehovah. You read the first verse there. Uh, the Lord, that word Lord there is uh, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah. Uh, and when you see the words all capitalized, uh, that represents the name that God gave himself to Moses. When Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said that because there's so many gods was in Egypt. And he was going to deliver his people and he talked to God about it. He said, well, Lord, who do I tell them has sent me? And God said, you just tell them I am that I am. And of course, we won't get into the pronunciation of the Hebrew there because there's no uh, way to pronounce it. So most, uh, in order for us to understand, they've written Yahweh. 
But any times in the King James Version of the Bible, I told you, you see the Lord capitalize that what that's what it means. So he's saying, Yahweh is my shepherd. Um, so the I am is my shepherd. And again, that word for shepherd is Roha. So I want to preach to you this morning on the thought Jehovah Roha this morning. And let me explain that word just for a moment. When you think of the word shepherd, Roha, which is uh, which the word Ra is uh, derived from, means shepherd in Hebrew. A shepherd is one who feeds or leads his flock. To, to pasture, to shepherd, or to feed, or to supply with food. He also tends to that flock. Every need they have, he will take care of that flock. An extended translation of the word uh, ro or roha is friend or companion. So that indicates the intimacy God desires between himself and his people. God wants an intimate relationship with you. He always has. He, he wants to see, I told you last week, uh, of his presence, his face. He wants an intimate uh, uh, relationship with you and with I. When those two words are combined, Jehovah Roha, it can be translated, the Lord is my friend. God is a friend who provides extravagant nourishment, protection as well as rest for our weary bodies and our souls. It's also, also translated as a tender. One who tends. A shepherd is one who tends his sheep. He doesn't just put them out in the pasture and let them go. He tends them. Takes care of them. I also told you some, this in the past. Uh, sometimes a shepherd will have to break the leg of a hungry sheep. A sheep that continues to run off. I know that we want to we want to love it to pieces. I understand what you're saying when we're in the new covenant. Well, yes, we are. But we learned something here. Jesus, of course, said, yes, he would leave the hundred, uh, leave the ninety-nine and go get the one. But what did he do when he went and got the one? Well, if a sheep continued to run off and lead other sheep astray, the shepherd would have to come in and break his leg. If you think that was easy, you've never done anything with animals. That's hard. That was hard on the shepherd. Not only did he have to, it was as hard for him to do, but he also had to nurture him back to health. It was not an easy thing. He did it because he loved his sheep. So I want to take a deeper look at Psalms 23 for just a few moments this morning. These six verses. And now why don't we go ahead and read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hallelujah. These six verses, when we look at them, we're allowed to listen to the great hymn, as it were. The great, we're listening to the great hymn writer of the Old Testament. And I think we're looking at his greatest song. This could be called, you might call it, this is one of David's greatest hits. <laughs> In my opinion. 
<laughs> David lifts his heart in song and honor as he honors the Lord that he loves. In these verses, David tells us that there's plenty to get all excited about when it comes to our Lord and to his goodness in our lives. Friends, I want to tell you, it's not all gloom and doom. Knock on plexiglass. <laughs> Wish we had a wooden pulpit. I'm old school. Hello? <laughs> I got a friend's church that I know they closed down. I'm going to call them and see if they want to get rid of the pulpit. And I might just go down and pick it up. Might not, but I'm just <laughs> There's a lot to be excited about. If you watch the news, you're going to probably find some negative stuff. I've been looking closely at AI lately. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I was w watching a report, I think even this morning on it, on, and they look so real. One of the questions that they brought up what did the articles, could an AI be a better leader, world leader? Uh, uh, you don't really want me to tell you what I think, do you? I believe they would do better than some. And I'm not going to call any names. I didn't say anything, I'm not going to say anything about it. But here's the whole thing. I look at this and it's preparing us for something in the future that we've been telling you for four or five years. Hello? I got news for you. It's happening before our eyes. We thought it's not in my life, and yes, in our lifetime, it's happening. That tells me Jesus. It's coming soon. So the gloom and doom that the world sees is exciting for you and I. Right. Surely he's coming and he's coming soon. Yeah, yeah. I read a lot of people. One of the people I read is Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Yeah. And I read an article. I, I read, I think, uh, uh, print from Charisma News. And I read an article that he was talking about. And can I just read this part to you? It's all right. They use big words, so I might get stumbled up. I'm going to quote Rabbi Jonathan Kahn for a moment. This article says, says Kahn, actually according to Charisma News, says Kahn emphasizing that a civilization that was once dedicated to God and, and spreading the gospel, he says, if a civilization that was once dedicated to God and spreading the gospel can fall into moral decay, then it's crucial to take heed and learn from history. Mm -hmm. Referring to the complicated situation now facing the United States, the rabbi expressed the country has been transformed into a nation that fights against divine principles. Also expressing the warning Call it is addressed not only to the United States, but also to believers, urging them to reflect on their own lives and ensure that they have not abandoned their faith and initial purpose. Khan highlights the risk of being influenced by a culture that goes against God and his teaching. He says Christians need to be vigilant about entertainment and the influences they allow both in their lives and in the lives of the loved ones. Yes. Somebody needs to say amen on that. Amen. The rabbi stresses the need to discern which forms of entertainment align with God's truth and draw the line, though he does not condemn all of them. Khan emphasizes the need to discern what aligns with God's truth and draw a line in the sand. He stresses the importance of continually uh, rededicating one's life to the Lord, seeking Him daily, and renewing one's love for Him. He serves as a reminder to, to live in God's power 
holiness and will, expressing a desire to be filled with the Spirit and to be on fire and with love for Him. Amen, Amen to that article. Amen. I could have got a sermon out of that article. <laughs> but the truth is, there is a lot of gloom and doom. But it's not all gloom and doom. I want you to listen in on David's song today. Let's listen to one of God's little sheep sing the song of the great shepherd. Remember this, David was not only a shepherd, but he was a sheep as well. Now, look, look at a few things. I want to look, first of all, who this sheep exalts. First of all, he exalts his name. David identifies the object of, uh, of his love as the Lord. The great I am, I told you that. This is the God of creation, the God of salvation, the God of eternity, the one and the only God. There is only one God. Let me take, say it again. There is only one God. There's not many ways to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. He is our Redeemer. He's our salvation this morning. Hallelujah. If you start compromising on that, you're losing your way. When you decide I'm going to go along with that philosophy, and we will name it Christula. Hello? Yeah. You cannot mix. Wow. Yeah, that's true. He said this, I'm going to praise the Lord, the great I am. David calls him Lord. Some people call him God. Some people call him friend. Some people call him father. Some people know him as Jesus. Uh, that is who David is talking about. It's a great uh, God that's placed his name above all other names. Hallelujah. And he put it in this song. So who's he exalting? Our Savior. Look at the nature of what he's talking about here. Of all the many names of the Lord that David could have magnified, he was led by the Spirit to sing about Jehovah Roha. Lord, my shepherd. Why? Glad you asked. Mm -hmm. Because the image of the shepherd tenderly leading, feeding, caring for a sheep is a perfect picture of our precious Savior and the Savior's relationship with the sheep. In fact, the image of himself as a shepherd was a favorite of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that? In John chapter 10, I'm not going to read to you the entire 1 through 30. Take a look at it. You'll find out he identifies himself as the sheep, as the shepherd. And the sheep knows his voice. I'll let you read it later. But as a look at this. I praise the Lord that when I got saved, I got more than just a savior. I got a shepherd. I got one that loves me. One that tends to me. One that cares about me. One that leads me. One that feeds me. One that mends me. One that protects me. And one that guides me through this life. When I got saved, when, uh, when you and I both got saved, we met one who had uh, made us his top priority. We are his top priority. You are the apple of his eye. He's concerned about everything that you go through this morning. You know, in this world, you find no one really that is that way. Maybe mama. My mama's gone. But no one is really concerned about every little thing. Donna, I'll say Donna is about me. But we're not, you find very few people that are concerned about everything you go through. God is. Guess what? If you stub your toe in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning and immediately you start calling the name of the Lord out, <laughs> I can only tell you this. I love you very much. 
don't call me at three o'clock in the morning to tell me that you stubbed your toe. <laughs> but you can tell Jesus. Amen. He is actually concerned about that. Amen. He is. Amen. When you hurt, he hurts. That's right. We have a high priest that moves with compassion. And feels with, with our infirmities. Now I want to move on because I am not looking like I'm going to get this done. I'm going to try. Verses 2 and 3. I want to look at what the sheep actually experiences. First of all, he experiences a personal relationship. I want you to know. If you're taking notes, underline that word personal. When the psalm begins writing, David is writing in the first person. It seems as though he's talking to us about the shepherd. And in doing so, he uses the possessive personal pronoun, pronoun my, to talk about his relationship with the Lord. He did not say the Lord is a shepherd. He did not say the Lord is our shepherd. He did not say the Lord is your shepherd. Instead, David tells us that he is that he has a personal relationship with the shepherd. He says the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. Think about that for a moment. He's my shepherd. He belongs to me and I belong to him. Can you actually say that today? If you can't, you need to be able to. Amen. He experiences a not only a personal relationship, but a very precious relationship. He's confident that the shepherd will take care of all of his needs. He says, I shall not want. In another place, I think it's somewhere around Psalms 37, he said the Young lions do want these. So on and so forth done. Do want, but those that love the Lord shall not lack anything. Somebody will find that and tell me after service, I know. He said, I shall not want. In fact, the rest of the psalm is a development around that very thought. As we as we build this message, as you'll see it's gonna be a Kind of a development around that thought. David is the Lord's little sheep. And he tells us the things that the great shepherd provides for him. You'll see the tenderness of the shepherd in verse 2. The shepherd makes him to lie down in green pastures. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? How many know anything about sheep? Any sheep farmers, sheep herders in here? <laughs> I know they taste good with mint jelly. <laughs> My neighbor in California has five acres of sheep. And they're beautiful. Yes, they are. Except at feeding time. I mean, <laughs> multiply that times a hundred. <laughs> And one day, we live out, it's out in the country. Jonathan was about 12, 13. And I had somebody pounding on my front door. I mean, just loud as they could pound. I thought, who in the world is going to walk up to somebody in the country like this and pound on their door like that? So I grabbed my shotgun and went to the door. Just a case. And she tell, told me, she said, would you please tell your son to stop shooting the gun? My sheep are in. They're having babies. What do they call it? Lambing. They're lambing. Birthing. They're having babies. I said, well, ma'am, I'm going to tell you, my son hasn't been out the house all morning. I said, if so, he don't allow to carry a gun. He don't have a gun. Well, I heard him. You better tell by that time, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Jonathan was standing beside me. 
And she looked down, she looked at me, and she said, oops, I'm sorry. I appreciate that. She's become a very good friend. But that, you know, when they're birthing, they, they need that solace. But I'm going to tell you something about the sheep. I've studied them since, uh, especially in biblical days. Nothing the sheep have changed, but we've certainly changed. But you'll notice that he takes them and he makes them to lie down in green pastures. I know this much about the sheep. I have not owned a sheep and I've owned some goats. It means you don't know anything about goats. Goats are ornery. Do not turn your back on a goat. Right. It hurts. And that do not leave your laundry hanging on the line. Around goats. I, more times than once, the goats would go up and take mama's laundry off the line and drag it out in the field. And eat it, nonetheless. Needless to say, what we had for dinner Sunday. But goats will eat anything. They'll eat weeds. Uh, you'll drive along the road to California. Some of the uh, counties have implored uh, and, uh, the use of goats along the roads, as you'll see them sometimes a hundred at a time. It's cheaper than paying somebody to go out there with a mower and mow it. They put goats out there. Uh, they've tried everything over there. They bailed it sometimes, and, but it was cheaper just to put goats up there. And goats will eat anything. And there's a lot of star thistle. Do you know what that is? Yeah. There's a lot of star thistle over there. And goats will eat star thistle. My goodness. Goats, I mean, sheep are not that way. Goats will eat weeds and all the trash that you can think of. Sheep prefer tender green grass. The shepherd will lead them to places where he knows they will be fed. Then, they will, then he'll make them lie down. Now that's a key right there, if you're not familiar with this. And make them lie down because he knows that they cannot properly digest their food unless they lie down. He also knows that sheep will lie, not lie down unless they feel perfectly safe from an enemy attack. You see, he knows that they need to lie down because their wool grows in thickness and richness in direct proportion to the time they spend resting and remunitating, re regurgitating. Chewing their cud. Know what, do you know what that is? Anybody knows what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Who does not know what that is? Sean, tell him later. <laughs> so as they lay in rest, the sheep will continually chew their cud and get all the nutrition, nutrition the vitamins, everything possible out of the food. So he looks for a place. With that in mind, the shepherd tenderly leads the sheep uh, to the places of greatest safety and nutrition. What a picture of what the Lord does for you and I. He knows we need to feed. He provides the best food for us. I said he provides the best food for us. He knows we need to rest. He allows uh, what we have ingested from him to be properly digested if we, uh, so that we can produce the maximum fruit for his glory. Uh, therefore, he leads us in the green pastures of his word, allowing us to graze on the richness uh, that's contained in it. And he sheltered us while we rest in the richness of his grace. Thank God that he does these things for you and I so we can find the best thing that God has for us. If you are spending time feeding from his word, can I say this? Can I? Thank you. You're a disgrace to the shepherd. 
when he brings you to the tender grasses and you turn your nose up at it and you wander off into the rocky terrain instead of eating and resting. Now for some reason, some people will never find the time to rest. And I don't know why that is. We feel like, well, the more we do, the better we are. How many are workaholics in here? Let's be honest. Robert? No. Um, honestly, how many are workaholics? I know some of you are. That's dangerous. I'm a workaholic, but I'm in recovery. I mean, with that, we talk about that. You can kill yourself as a workaholic. Amen? Some of you say, well, I can't stop. i got to pay the bills. If you don't stop, who's going to pay the bills when you're gone? See, God gives you the ability to rest. I don't mean he wants you to be a sluggard, slothful. He wants you to work. He wants you to provide. But he made seven days and then the seventh day he rested. Amen. Amen. He rested. You need to rest. And this is the way, and this is the spiritual rest we're talking about. He feeds you. Man, hallelujah. Reno, when we, years ago when we came over, we, used to, we, we loved to come to Reno. Because you could, go to the buff, you could go to the casinos and eat cheaper than you could buy food down at the grocery store. <laughs> Hello? Uh, and then COVID hit and they closed all the buffets. What in the world is a casino for if not for a buffet? I kept wondering, what are those people going to that building for? The buffet's closed. And so we were looking for buffets and somebody said, well, they... They opened the buffet up at Rail City again. How many heard that? They closed it back now. I said, what's the matter with them? I heard they opened one up. Jay's got one open. Let's go put them out of business, Sean. <laughs> we'll teach him to open another buffet in town. <laughs> but God has given us a buffet to eat. Then he says, lay down and rest and let and meditate. This really means that he would regurgitate the word of God. Meditate on the word of God and feed on it. He leads us into the green pastures of his word. Allows us to graze on it. What a tender shepherd we have. He fights off the world so we have time to rest in him. He tenderly meets our needs. Do you take advantage of that privilege? Oh, look at the thoughtfulness of the shepherd. Again, look at verse 2 for a second. The shepherd leads his sheep beside the sealed waters. Because he knows this. You may know this or may not. Sheep will not drink from a running stream. Wow. Did you know that? No. How many would like to know why? Glad you asked. <laughs> because he knows the sheep. Actually, sheep actually have a morbid fear of the water. Why is that? Because they're not designed for swimming. How many have ever seen a sheep after they shear them? I watch, I watch them in the, in the pasture next door to me. And man, they look so fluffy and big and 
man, I said, boy, he'd probably be juicy. <laughs> <laughs> they got short legs. And then when she's through shearing the wool off of them, look at them. Where'd all those fat little sheep go? <laughs> well, see, they have short legs and they have a whole big mass of wool on the outside. So, what do you say, Bishop? Well, the heavy coats of wool and their skinny legs make them extremely top heavy. I can identify with that <laughs> because of my very large brain. You guys were thinking something toward the midsection. Oh, you're thinking brain guy. You see, in the, and if in the water, their willow fills with water, they easily can flip over and drown. So they're afraid to get in that running water. They might get wet and it might sweep them off their feet and flip over. They never make it out. The sheep the, uh, know this and they shy away from running water. The shepherd knows this, so he searches and he finds out easy, still pools for them to drink from. In fact, if it's necessary, he'll build a little dam to catch a pool of water so they can drink from it. Hmm. I hope you're getting this this morning. How much he loves you. See, the great shepherd knows the need, uh, the cool waters of his grace for us to make it through this world. We are living in some tumultuous times, very treacherous times. It seems like every morning we get up, something else has happened. And you say, what's coming next? He knows that we need places of stillness where, they can, where we can rest and reflect upon him and his blessings. He cares about those things we're facing in our life today. Everything we're facing. And He provides a place of rest, of peace, of safety. Every day, He provides a place in our life that of escape for you and I. And one more little thing. Verse 3. He experiences a profound relationship. Verse 3 says, He restoreth my soul and leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now I want you to notice the good shepherd provides life. Here's where the relation changes. It goes between a human shepherd and his sheep. The heavenly shepherd and his sheep move into a different direction. You see, the good shepherd gives the sheep something that no human shepherd could possibly give them. Could never provide for his flock. You know what that is? Life. You see, the human shepherd provides everything needed for a sheep to maintain life. The fact remains that he receives the sheep after they already have life. On the other hand, Jesus finds the sheep dead in their trespasses and sin. As Linda read this morning, the book of Ephesians says, we once were foreigner strangers. Did you read that? I don't know what quite version you read. Ephesians chapter 2. It says, we were foreigners and strangers. You had, you had the quicken who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Thank you, my brother. Oh, I got it written down here. In times past, you walked according to the course of this world. You were like the rest of the world, the prince of the power of the air. You were like that. You and I were like that. But wait a minute, something happened. That next part. We also had our lifestyle in times past, according and the lusts of our flesh fulfilled. Somewhere you were like this, fulfilling the. Sires of the flesh. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love for with he loved us. 
I don't know if you remember me preaching a few years ago on that thought, but God. Yeah. What is God not rich in? Hallelujah. God gave His life that you and I might have life. When He found you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But, He goes on, we were foreigners and strangers Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Somewhere it says that in Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians. But he tells us that. We were lost. We did not, we did not have access to a God. Imagine being in God's world without God. Having no access to it. On the outside looking in. I know some people don't put much stock in church anymore. But there's an old saying, you never miss the water till the well runs dry. That's right. I got news for you. Someday they'll be knocking at the doors and saying, let me in. Noah, open that door. Let us in. I can't. God's closed the door. We're headed to heaven. See you later. The scariest verse in the Bible? Depart from me. I never knew you. You that worked iniquity. What a horrible thought. But he gave us life. You look at this phrase. Restoreth my soul in verse 3. That literally means to bring back. The good shepherd brings back the wayward soul from death into life. I'm glad that Jesus found me. Hallelujah. I know that there's a bumper sticker that I think came out with, with Jerry Falwell. I found Jesus. I don't remember those bumper stickers. Everywhere you look, there was a bumper sticker. I saw bumper stickers on cars that didn't have bumpers. <laughs> I found Jesus. I got news for you. Jesus wasn't lost. I was lost. He found me. Thank God He found me. He gave me life. I was dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins. But thank God He brought me back to life. He breathed uh, into my nostrils and He gave me the breath of life. And now I'm heaven bound. I've got a new life. I started over. I'm not the same man that I used to be. God will come in and He will change you. He will make you different. Amen. Thank God. Thank you. Now some of you here this morning may be shaking your head. I don't buy that preacher. No? That's okay. But let me tell you something. One day you're going to wake up and say, Wow, I remember that morning in July. On Sunday morning, July the 9th. When that preacher that didn't hardly have enough air to get it all out said, that I was dead in my trespasses and sins and that the great shepherd wanted to restore me and I turned away. You ever seen anybody brought back to life? I was standing at the end of my dad's bed. I was 15 years old. He's in the emergency room in the hospital. And they're standing there as they were all working on him. And I heard the word code blue, code blue in that room. And I had no idea what code blue was. I thought it was a, you know, I've heard of blue light special at Kmart, but I didn't know what code blue was. And so I watched as they worked on my father. The rest of my family was in this little side room 
crying probably loud, so loud they had to put them in there. I was sitting there, there was tears. coming down my face, sure. But I wanted to see. I don't know why. But I wanted to see. And they all was there working on him and they somebody said clear and they hit him with the the pads. The fibrillator. And I saw his body go like that. And for a second they continued to work on him. And they said it again. And they did it again. And finally they, the doctor said, my daddy was gone. And you talk about somebody that was mad. But I was mad at God. How can you do this to me, God? I'm 50, you love me? I'm 15 years old and you took the best part of my life away from me. You know so little at 15. You know so little at 15. Now I realize that I have just one more reason to go to heaven. You'll remember one day hearing this story about how Jesus could bring you back to life. Yes. But you said, don't do that. No. I wanna, I'm going to stop here. Could you play that song you was playing with those kids a while ago? How did you come up? Nobody loves you like Jesus. Amen.